about that? How about that? Yay! <laughs> to chat, did you did you guys get to see it? Did it play the whole way through? Yes! Okay! Yay! Yay! <laughs> All right. So yes, so we are going to be playing Socrates Jones. Thank you again, chat, for bearing with me. Uh, guess this means that I can just skip through half the video. I don't have to edit much. I just trash all the scuff, call it good, or save it in a very secret dark file in case I someday get big enough to point to it and be like, oh, look at, look at this back in the day. Look at how, look at how scuffed I was. Ha ha, we can laugh about it now. <laughs> but all right, so we're going to see if I can pull up Socrates Jones here because we are going to learn about philosophy today. Let me make sure the window's going to show up for you guys at least. There we go. Okay. And we'll see if... Hey! It worked! Yay! <laughs> All right, so what we're going to be doing this week is we are going to be negotiating for our lives as junior philosophers and people who have gone into the great unknown and are trying to get out of it because we have a daughter and she wagered her life for ours, kids these days. But anyway, so... Uh, let me go ahead and see if we can continue. Ah, yes, the Arbiter. By the way, is the, is the noise suppression working at the moment? I can't remember if I put my filter on. I was trying to cut down on all the um, fan noises. I think it worked. If you can hear me, it's we're doing okay. <laughs> and once again, we see the Arbiter, who I, I still love his little, his happy face. You know, not very many people can emote through a, a mask made of bone. But, you know, that means you just have to um, go the extra mile. If you, if you can't emote through bone, then what are you doing in your life? <laughs> anyway, well, I must say, Socrates, I'm impressed. Huh? <laughs> Hobbes holds significant significant clout here in the intelligible realm. Ah, yes, we just got done arguing with Hobbes, who was telling us about how I believe man needs a king with whom he holds a contract to be able to enforce laws because man's nature is savage. So, and we told him that. It was BS because he get, came up with 25 different examples and none of them had an, and it would basically be infinite examples of why it should work and why it didn't work. <laughs> F and Hobbes. Yeah. Yeah. You take that. <laughs> he was, he was a jerk. He did, uh, have very, uh, much, um, you puny mortals with your simple minds vibes. His ideas influenced later prominent thinkers such as John Locke, John Jacques was. Let me see if I can get my French out here, accent out here. R Rousseau and John Rawls. <laughs> Listen, I've tried to read Le Leviathan. <laughs> that man is conservative to the extreme. <laughs> And now he's dead. Yes. It's very dead. <laughs> Casca nightmare. Besting him or even getting him to question the logic of his ideas is a significant accomplishment. I know, right? Still holds true today. 
Does this mean that dad gets to come home now? Nope. The door is still closed. <laughs> Indeed, your successes here, while impressive, cannot be construed as providing an answer. The only that they only mean that Socrates is ready to face even greater challenges. He's so happy. Yay, challenges! <laughs> He's making that face that you make when you like your professor comes in with something that's going to be really tedious and awful. <laughs> he and they are very into it and nobody else is. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm I don't wanna. Can we go home? <laughs> He's so gung ho about this, right? You you gotta find what you love in life. Sometimes that means arguing other people <laughs> out or into or out of their lives. <laughs> Great. Okay, then. So which arrogant know-it-all do I have the honor of facing next? Do you mean f philosophers? <laughs> I believe that would be me. Wait, wait, is that? Oh, it's the fangirl's favorite. Yeah, Dad, get with it. He was a member of Parliament and an early feminist as well. I've mentioned him at least four times today. Ah, you kids and your uh, critical thinking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Not to worry, old chap. I'm sure we will get to know each other quite well by the end of the day. Shall we begin? In our society, good comes from the accomplishment of some desirable end. However, happiness and freedom from suffering are the only things truly desirable at, as ends. Thus, actions are in right proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce unhappiness. As a result, one should choose every action in order to maximize overall happiness. And there you have it, gentlemen. Happiness must be the source of all good. Mm, I don't know about that one, chief. Good is happiness added to the idea slate. This is the core idea behind act utilit <laughs> I'm never gonna make that today. Act utilitarianism. <laughs> Yee! He's so amazing! Isn't he amazing, Dad? <laughs> oh my gosh, sign my scarf. If we're take if we're talking guys with weird ideas, Mill. <laughs> uh I guess. He's about 200 years older than you. Tone it down a notch. <laughs> Don't kink shame. Some of us like are those, you know, a thousand year old brains. He thinks you can write an equation for chemical processes in the brain. Uh, I mean... I mean, maybe. Well, Socrates, you have heard John's presentation. What is your intended course of action? Well, Dad, look, this is the closest thing to the nature of morality as we're going to get. Ah, uh, ye of too much faith. How do you know that? I've studied him for ages. That's how he's brilliant. Uh-huh. Come on, Dad. If you just acknowledge that, you can get out of here. <sighs> uh, let's see. Not an equation of... It would be something to do with synapses. Yeah. Sorry. I'm... I'm I, I'm getting distracted by chat. Oh my gosh, speaking of, chat is hidden. Hang on, hang on a tick. You can't even see chat. 
Welcome back, chat. There. There we go. Ta-da. Magic trick. <laughs> well, Socrates, do you accept Mill's principles? Actually, I believe I'll ask the MP a few questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> what? <laughs> By all means, go ahead. Oh, what was it they said? Never fall so, fall so in love with your own uh, hypothesis that you are afraid of it being different than what you expected. It is only healthy for individuals to voice their queries. Trapped thoughts have no use, after all. I mean, sometimes. <laughs> In our society, good comes from accomplishment of some desirable end. Um, okay, I'm going to call that good for now. Freedom from suffering are the only things truly desirable it ends. Uh, hmm. What's your backing? Can you back this up? Most things which mankind values, love, peace, and property, are valued because they further some other end. If we follow such value chains to their conclusions, they all come to rest on happiness. For example, peace furthers security, which furthers luxury, which furthers happiness. See? Very well reasoned. Okay, let's see. Thus, actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce unhappiness. What evidence do you have to support this? This seems pretty self-sufficient to me. Hmm. See, I don't know. I think you can do good in the world even if it doesn't bring you happiness. It's just that you know it brings other people happiness. Oh wait, that plays into his thing. <laughs> Whoops. Actions make people happy. There must be something positive about them. Mm, I don't know about that. Hat. <laughs> Welcome to the chat, uh, Vosnia. Simply put, an action is as right as the happiness it creates. But happiness for whom? For the self or for others? The overall population distribution is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Happiness dis distribution added to the idea sleep. Wrongs tend to print out unhappiness. As a result, one should choose every action in order to maximize overall happiness. Hmm. I think I'm going to challenge that with the... Uh, Like, how are you supposed to maximize happiness unless you know for sure it is, like, good is happiness and happiness distribution. Well, we'll, we'll give it a try. Well, actually, let me, let me save my progress. Just in case. John Stuart Mill. Yes, Socrates. I understand the reason behind your philosophy, but applying your reasoning in all situations creates some worrisome implications. Dad, are you serious? <laughs> She's like, oh my god, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> Mill's philosophy is perfect, you just can't go. Continue, Socrates. Gladly. The problem here is that happiness is not... Oh, I didn't even add the audio, sorry guys. There we go. The problem here is that happiness is not equivalently exchanged. It can be gained and lost in unequal measure. Since your philosophy does not care how happiness is distributed, it leads to some unfortunate scenarios. Oh really? Do explain. Let's say, for example, that I'd gain twice, twice as much happiness from pr punching Hobbes in the face. <laughs> I'd 
I'd gain twice as much happiness from punching Hobbs in the face as he'd lose from being punched. <laughs> the guy was already pretty miserable after all. According to your philosophy, in this situation, punching Hobbs would be entirely moral as it would increase overall happiness. There you go, that's the ticket. But as much as Hobbs was a jerk, I can't believe random violence would be the right course of action. I don't know, have you tried it? <laughs> Indeed, I think I prefer my debates not devolving into fistfights. But dad, that's just one example. Well then, let me provide another, Ari. Let's say there was a monster that would gain far more happiness from eating you than you'd ever gain over the course of your life. Would the moral action be to feed yourself to the monster? Mill's philosophy would say yes, but that seems preposterous, do pre bleh, preposterous does it not? Dad, what are you doing? That situation would never arise. Oh, my sweet summer child. As if all philosophy questions came out of only sensible uh, theories. It's not just that, it's not just that it's moral to punch Hobbs. <laughs> it's just that it'd be immoral to not punch Hobbs. There you go. <laughs> that's the real that's the uh, real big brain thoughts. Bringing imaginary monsters into a debate, is that really how you intend to get home? Why not? Nonsense! Actually, your father raises some good points. What? But, uh, but... Is that her name? Ariadne? He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Ooh. As thinkers, it is our job to not only challenge the thoughts of others, but to challenge ourselves. Yeah, you'll never get the internet to believe to that, agree to that one. <laughs> both thought experiments Socrates presented are valid, and both are troubling. Judging every choice that arises seems, upon, re upon reflection, difficult to defend. Are you serious? Please, don't let my dad run all over you. Not to worry, Ariadne. The core of my philosophy still stands strong. Allow me a moment, gentlemen, to present an altered position. And allow me, sweeping broom, to get a drink of water. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> Sorry, I came back and I saw myself staring angrily at the screen. My bad. That was <clears throat> very ominous. The problem you have described can be addressed through application of universal rules. These rules should be chosen in order to create the most happiness possible with as little harm as possible. <laughs> you can go back and do it after. While well, these rules may not maximi maximize overall happiness, they will at least guarantee that happiness never decreases. Actions can be considered moral when they follow such rules. As you can see, it is still possible for happiness to be the source of morality. I believe I shall refer to this approach as rural utilitarianism. Yay, I've say it, learned to say it. <laughs> An interesting evolution of your ideas, indeed. You see, Dad, Mill's philosophy is solid, as I told you. Because, you know, I actually studied... 
Tell me you're a hipster without telling me you're a hipster. Because, you know, I actually, actually study this stuff. Whatever happened to me having to decide for myself? <laughs> yeah, well, that was before you hopped on the smug wagon. <sighs> okay. Smug wagon. <laughs> the smug wagon, okay. Socrates, shall we continue? I guess so. The problem you've described can be addressed through the application of universal rules. These rules should be chosen in order to create the most happiness possible as, with as little harm as possible. That seems sketchy. While these rules may not maximize overall happiness, they will at least guarantee that happiness never decreases. Actions can be considered more when they follow such rules. Uh, I believe this is clear. If you follow the rules, you'll be acting morally. Hmm. Okay. But how do you know they won't? Yeah. How do you know that it will back up the happiness? Sorry, I didn't say that right. Of course, old chap. Let us consider the rule that citizens are considered innocent until proven guilty. I will demonstrate this rule increases overall happiness in most situations. Mm, I don't know about that. Excuse me. With this rule, any man knows he will get a fair trial and thus is protected from false accusation. True, sometimes guilty criminals get away as a result, but you, can you imagine a world where this rule will not were not applied? Power-hungry prosecutors read, would run innocent men into the ground with defense attorneys having to fight against ridiculous odds just to prove them innocent. Uh, yeah. Thank you, a, that never happens these days. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that sounds terrible. I know, right? Yes, it truly would be. Might make an interesting game, though. <laughs> something, something, uh, begins with a P, ends with right. Well, these rules may not max. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, just, well, how? Yeah, this is weird too. What do you mean by rules? Are we talking about contracts? No. Well, Hobbes' theory and this one could result in the same guidelines. The rationale behind their existence would be different. There are certain rules which, if all was followed, would make a soci society a happier place than if they were not. These are rules which meet with the qualifications of rural utilitarianism. A cow, though. As happiness is still the only ultimate end, the only rules that make sense would be the ones that further that end. Mm. Thus, it makes sense the rules which govern our actions should be chosen accordingly. Good is happiness. Hmm, let me save it real quick. Create the most happiness as little as possible. See, the thing is that you can't claim that good is happiness and then. Because, you know. And then make rules based off of that because then you can still. Like the. It's the whole, you know, just the, the flaw in the first place is still what is good is what makes people happy, and that's not necessarily true. You can still have, uh, happy, can have happy, people happy with not good. We'll try that. 
Oh, no, why? I officially don't know this person. Uh, <laughs> rude! Promise of rules. rules. Okay. How are we going to apply them? Describe new problem of distribution. The effect. Act utilitarianism does not care where happiness goes, right? This can be addressed by following general rules, which I will elaborate upon later. How will it be addressed? Because these rules apply equally to everyone, the problem of distribution is irrelevant. They have the same chance of helping one group of or individuals, one group or individual as any other. Will that really be the case? I don't think so. Uh, we'll see if I can challenge that. Oh no! Okay. All right. All right. Most happiness possible, little harm as possible. Well, these will not make max up. Wait, sorry, I'm, I'm just mumbling my way through it. What do you mean by this? Most of the time, the rules we follow should result in a net gain of happiness for society. Well, this may not always be the case, such a situation where one's free speech hurts another's feelings. Society is much better off if these rules are always applied than if they're never applied. They follow such rules. Based on everything I have established here, following the rules will promote happiness most of the time. Thus, we can assume those who follow the rules are performing morally. Most of the time. So even when the rules create unhappiness, we should still follow them? Well, no. Theoretically, if in a certain situation following a rule created enough happiness, that rule should be revamped. Broken and replaced with a more nuanced rule. Interesting. Let's save that again. The happiness never decreases. The following rule will create unhappiness, which replace it with a more nuanced rule. Hmm. We'll try the, uh, rule nuances. Nonsense. The game's up, old chap. <laughs> oh no, dad, don't you dare throw this away. Man. I dare. The audacity. <laughs> Ari, I know you idolize this man, but it's time to accept his ideas are not my way out of here. For the philosophy he just proposed boils down to the same one as before, right? Now hold on, I think that's a bit unfair. Is it? Is it? John Stuart Mill, you said rules should be created along lines which further happiness, correct? Of course. And when the rules fail to further happiness, they should be replaced with more nuanced rules. Yes, indeed. What is the problem? That's very different from his original idea. Is that so? Then answer me this. Riddle me this. <laughs> if you keep making the rules more and more nuanced, where will you wind up? Huh? <laughs> You'll wind up with the idea we should act in order to maximize happiness. Wait, what? <laughs> The fact is, no matter what rules Mill comes up with, there will always be several steps removed from his original idea. And thus, they are imperfect promotions of happiness. We'll have to keep replacing these rules when they fall, rules when they fall short, until we're back to where we started. Circular logic. It sure is. Excellent deduction, Socrates. Indeed, most insightful. I still will debate Mills over Hobbes every, any day. Just saying. No matter how you spin it, rule you. No, I was saying so good. Rule you. 
Utilitarianism ultimately boils down to act utilitarianism. And thus, all the problems we originally established are still there. Our happiness is just waiting for a giant monster to come and gobble it up. <laughs> no. No! No! Oh no. Why? Arg! Ari? You are the monster, Dad! The real monster! Don't you see what you're doing? He's doing a philosophy. Weren't you paying attention? This could have been your only hope of getting back! Our only hope of getting back! Ari, I... You are useless, Dad! Did you ever stop to consider? I... I... I wasted my life to give you this chance! You're ruining my life, Dad! <laughs> Philosophically stunned by teenage girls. What did you just say? What did you mean just now, Ari? I put my own life on the line so you could take the challenge. Are you serious? You didn't figure this out? <laughs> my dude, you haven't figured this out for... <sighs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm exasperated. I didn't think he would go over his head. I thought if there was a chance, any chance, we should take it. But Mill is one of the best philosophers out there, and you've run right over him without a thought. Isn't that the, the point? You're going to wind up throwing away both our lives for the sake of your stupid style points. I think you're doing philosophy wrong, kiddo. Yeah, you tell her. Ariadne Jones? I understand where you're coming from, but your father has not done ill by your sacrifice. <laughs> If you've run over a philosophy rather easily, it's a bad philosophy. I know, right? Not since my days in Parliament have I been subjected to such a spirited critique. That's how you do a real science. <laughs> You're like, no, come at me, bro. I want to see it. You said, if I'm wrong, show me. Let's square up. Mill, listen, both of you. Unquestionably, it is possible to do without happiness. It is done involuntarily by 1920ths of mankind. Spirited critiques. <laughs> but you, you don't have to be among them. That's the, that's the real takeaway. Best, <clears throat> the best application of philosophy is not to other people, but to help you with your own thoughts. Ari? Why didn't you discuss this with me? Uh, cause she's an impulsive teenage kid. Would you have taken the challenge if I had? I have to appreciate how relaxing this game's soundtrack is. I know, right? Dad, I couldn't just let you die. If I had, the loss of happiness would have been too great. Aww. But the Arbiter told me the challenge was the only way to bring you back. And the reward could only match what was at stake. So I... What were you thinking, Ari? You should have gone home. You'd have done the same thing if it were me. I mean... True. Yes, well, you're my daughter. And you're my father, and believe it or not, I don't want to lose you. I did this because I honestly thought you deserved the chance, and I've been helping you however I could. But you're not even taking this seriously. Now you're the one with the wrong philosophy. Where, <laughs> do you have any evidence supporting that? <laughs> How could you say that, right? 
You face philosophers with so many different ideas, so many different outlooks. Any one of them could have been onto something, but you've torn them all apart without a thought. Well, that's, that's kind of the point. Your cunning remarks, your biting comments. <laughs> you don't really care about getting home, you're just showing off. No, that's how you do a philosophy. Look, Ari, it's true I've been getting a little carried away. I've never been good at this stuff, and you've always loved it. I guess I'm just starting to see why. Ah, she made a believer out of him, huh? But it doesn't matter, does it? In the end, you'll still blaze through the options presented to you, tearing them apart because you're so sure they are wrong. Ah, just like true Socrates. <laughs> no, Ari, it's actually the opposite. I feel like I don't know anything, and I can't accept their ideas without understanding them inside and out, especially now I know that I'm not the one at stake. It's, it's bomb being being ass. <laughs> this this is just that's that's philosophy. It's discourse. <laughs> you have to learn to be cool with uh, tearing down other people's arguments and having your own torn down. I'm not here to prove them wrong. I'm here to see if they're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> A little louder. Mill was right. You've really been working hard. I just... It's okay, Ari. I understand. Moral of the story, never meet your heroes. <laughs> because then your dad will out-argue them. Really? Yeah, your dad's a doofus sometimes. You shouldn't have done something like that. But I'll ground you for it when we make it home. <laughs> and promise me you'll never take up gambling, okay? You're smart, but you don't have a knack for playing the odds. <laughs> Ouch. Gonna need to be in the hospital after for that burn when we're out of here. I guess not. Arbiter? I'm tired of this stupid world. Bring out your best philosopher. It's high time I provided returns on my daughter's bet. Yay. Let's go. Paved with good intentions. Chapter 5. Socrates. Yes, Arbiter. I have been pondering your request that I bring forth my best. Ooh, I got a, I got an achievement. Utility, futility. <laughs> it seems to me attempting to assign a quality hierarchy to a false in this realm would be demeaning. Yeah, it's like orange is better than purple or something. Achievement is we beat chapter four. I have thus determined that when you requested my best, you meant my most challenging. Wait, what? So on that note, allow me to present you Manuel Kant. <laughs> Is that your best? Okay, I, I won't take the easy road. I won't make a Kant pun. His thoughts are indeed quite challenging. <laughs> <clears throat> the harpsichord. I need. Uh, let's see if I can get my accent. Guten Tag, Socrates Jones. Oh God! <laughs> Good luck with this one. <laughs> I could only ever get the f for the, through the first couple pages of his work. When I, I think I read some of this stuff. I hope you'll enjoy. I cannot. I don't want to try a German accent. I hope you enjoyed your stay in philosophical kindergarten. For the conflicting methods you have employed to confuse others, philosophers will not work here. Can't a clan <laughs> racist. <laughs> Why not? 
No reason. I simply need to fulfill the prerequisite grandstanding. <laughs> I hate that he knows that he needs to grandstand. Grandstanding. Check. <laughs> how... Uh... How like him to need to have a checklist, I guess. Uh... Okay, then. Can't if you would please explain your philosophy. <laughs> the, the the pause. Can't if you would please explain your philosophy as clearly as possible. Of course, arbiter. First, I must counter the unreasoned thoughts of other philosophers. <laughs> Any true moral philosophy must, first and foremost, protect human dignity. As consequentialist thought naturally violates our pride as men, we must work from intentionalist grounding. <laughs> no. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm already confused. <laughs> Give me a moment, Herr Jones, and I shall explain. Chad, I apologize if I try to get the German and fail. Please don't be angry with me. German speakers out there. <laughs> there are many things which men covet as good. Like the ability to mimic a German accent. However, a focus on consequences reduces men to mere means undermining human dignity. In reality, the only thing that is good without qualification is goodwill. Thus, we are moral if our will is defined by the intention of doing the moral thing. And there we go. As you can see, I am approaching this from a different angle than the neophytes you debuted, no, debated before. Intentionalism added to the idea slate. I see... So wait, the consequences of actions don't matter at all? <laughs> at the very least, they are irrelevant to moral worth. Of course, ideally one's actions would also have positive consequences, but it is positive intentions that are essential to be a, of moral character. Socrates, are you ready to continue? No. <laughs> Alright, here goes. So far this doesn't seem too bad. Oh, we have, we're not even through it yet. Yeah, let us begin then. There are many things which men covet as good. Like? I believe this is simply stated. Our disorganized society holds many things in high esteem. Okay. However, a focus on consequences reduces men to mere means undermining human dignity. What do you have to support this statement? I believe you have actually discovered this yourself, Socrates Jones. <laughs> He's a clown and a racist and a homebody. <laughs> and he dresses funny. <laughs> and nobody likes your cravat. Take, for example, John Stuart Mill and his philosophy of util you don't know, utilitarianism. By arbitrarily assigning the status of ultimate end to happiness, the philosophy completely ignores human rights and dignity. And Hobbes' idea that good rests in security, any rational person would question how much we must sacrifice him for such an ideal. No, all of these philosophers are looking the wrong places. They are claiming the contingent and inferior as eternal without justification. Mankind must not be reduced to the means of some other goal. Any philosophy that does so has become mired in consequentialism. <laughs> That's a Austin Powers right. Let's see. In reality, the only thing that is good without qualifications is goodwill. Can you back this up? 
As a man cannot possibly know the consequences consequences of his actions, it is only fit to judge the will upon which he acts. When the will is good, there can be no doubt that, regardless of effect, his actions were moral in nature. Mm. Assessing the will is the only way to keep man as an end and maintain his dignity. So what you're saying is, when I tell Ari she can't play games all night because I'm concerned for her, my action is noble regardless of her response? <laughs> that is correct. This is correct. Pardon. Dad. Uh. Hmm. Thus we are moral if our will is defined by the intention of doing the moral thing. Can you back this up? If we accept that goodwill is the only true good, then you would agree with me that we must always act with moral intentions. If we do the right thing for reasons other than good intentions, our action is less commendable. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess. Hmm, what's our idea slate? It must be intention based. I'll try clarifying. As long as we intend to act morally, then we are, ourselves are moral. This seems pretty straightforward, does it not, Hera Jones? But uh, how do we know whether the intended course of action is moral? By whether or not it adheres to the categorical imperatives, of course. What? Oh, of course. No, wait. <laughs> uh, what? Can't these things you just mentioned. Categorical imperatives? Yes, uh, what are they exactly? <laughs> Indeed, I don't believe you ever explained those. My apologies. <laughs> Categorical imperatives are the moral laws we should seek to discover. Listen closely, I shall explain. And listen closely because I need another drink of water before I get to utilitarianism again. <laughs> Okay. Here we go. If we intend to always do the moral thing, we must develop rules or maxims to shape our actions. There are certain actions which we must always avoid. Other actions we should take at every opportunity. <laughs> These ideas form rules we must follow at all times regardless of emotion or consequence. These rules are categorical imperatives. Okay, the confusion people feel about this man's ideas makes sense now. <laughs> Where should I begin? <laughs> I love the Mr. Burns. Excellent steepled fingers there. Um, Kant? <laughs> ah, apologies, Hera Jones. I was momentarily distracted by your beard. It is unsightly. How can one stand to have such a blemish upon one's face? Oh, is it a goatee? Does he have a soul patch? Oh, no. That's rude. Hey, the goatee is one of the few cool things about my dad. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ari. Personally, I always like the sweater vest. <laughs> It's pronounced like utility. Yeah. So, well, sorry, it's I'm for reading that late, but yeah, we'll see if I can make it through without fumbling again. Well, regardless of how you all feel about my beard or my sweater vest, I have questions for you, Kant. I like the glasses. Since we're talking about his sweater vest and soul patch and stuff. That soul patch is 
a goatee, sporter vest, and entire appearance. It's way cooler than like a beret and a scarf anyway. Of course, ask away. <clears throat> if we intend to always do the moral thing, we must develop rules or maxims to shape our actions. Why? This is very much a continuation of my last argument. Our intentions must be defined somehow with rules that shape what we should and should not do. For without the guidance of rules, we will be truly lost. But... Let me say it real quick, because... If you need rules, then wh what about intentions? Aww. I <laughs> Tell German stereotypes. Ah, a senseless counterpoint. Yeah, it is a waste. Did he just claim you, s you said something is senseless? I'm actually not sure who's making less sense right now. <laughs> Ouch. Um. There are certain actions which we must always avoid. Like. There are certain things that are clearly always wrong when the maxim behind them is examined. This seems like a grand statement. Do you have an example? Lying is an example. To lie is to spread deceit among men. By a lie, man, a man annihilates his dignity as a man. Thus, one should never lie, ever. Hmm, interesting. Other actions we should take at every opportunity. Like, give an example. Helping a dying man. By attempting to render such assistance, one respects human dignity. One should always make the attempt. See, Dad, Kant also thinks I did the right thing. I thought you weren't much of a Kant fan. Hush, validation is always nice even if it comes in a confusing package. Help a dying man, okay. These ideas from rules we must follow at all times regardless of emotion or consequence. Why such a strict line? When we deem some maxim to be moral, we must follow it. For if we do not, then the power of the idea is undermined and no good can come from it. These rules are categorical imperatives. What does this mean exactly? Simple, they are categorical, meaning they apply to everyone without ex exception. They are also imperative, meaning they tell us how to behave. Kant was always making up terms, Dad. <laughs> That's part of what made him such a lovely read. <laughs> you heard him, you should... You heard him earlier, you shouldn't lie. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's see. So we need... Hmm. Never lie and help the dying man. Must be intention based. Uh, try this real quick. Being a term I coined and assigned, I don't think it's necessary. I choose the term so it is the right one. <laughs> That's him in a nutshell. Oh, uh, let's see. I think I should go with never lie. Nonsense! Hold on just a moment. Kant, you claim we should never lie, correct? That telling the truth is a categorical imperative? Indeed, it is the prime example of one. Right, and you also claim we must follow imperatives without fail, correct? Correct, Herr Jones. Well, that's interesting, because using only those two facts, we're already in a worrisome place. Oh? <laughs> I will admit that, in most situations, lying is not the most moral of choices. But there's no denying that there are some situations when the truth can be deadly. 
Situations where lying would be the better thing to do. Ah. Let's say one was sheltering fugitives from an oppressive regime, keeping them hidden from the forces which would persecute them. It seems to me that keeping them hidden is clearly the right choice, but you would want us to blab to every person who shows up at the door. This strikes me as empirically wrong. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> Way to go, Dad. Oh, let's see if I can... <laughs> I apologize in advance. Nitrchon weiter bitte. Don't know what that means, but I tried. Uh, right. You can swear in German all you want, but I have a point. Earlier, the, the counter argument. The earlier you start, you stated anything that needs qualification can't be the origin of morality. The counter argument from Kant is that you're not obligated to tell the truth. You're just obligated not to lie. You just say you prefer not to answer. We'll see if that pops up. But you're a prime example of an imperative just demanded a qualification. Well, what do you have to say to that, Kant? Watch, chat's gonna predict what he has to say. Doesn't the intention to protect people also have value? Even from your perspective, that your law seems far from universal. Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> no. Sorry. Here it come. I bet you chat called it. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me, I have to take my morning walk. Uh, sorry. Uh, I know a lot of German friends and they very much enjoy exercise. So. <laughs> Needs to go look it up in his book. That too. <laughs> if your walks at such regularity, people claimed you could set your watch by it. Uh, that seems common of what I know. What I fondly know of my friends who visited Germany. <laughs> he just walked off. He does that sometimes. Do not worry. I wish I could do that sometimes. Oh, you're back. Indeed, my morning walk is completed. Morning walk. Check. <laughs> oh. Is there, a, is there a even morning in the intelligible realm? You can. You can always just walk away. That's true. That's true. Uh, I guess I would say I wish I wouldn't get uh, social repercussions from just walking away in the middle of a, of a conversation. There you go. No, there isn't. It is unacceptable. <laughs> but regardless, back on task. Socrates Jones, the counterpoint you gave earlier was false. That one should not lie still stands as universal. Despite your objections, there's no doubt that to lie in that situation would be immoral. Categorical imperatives stand as an absolute without qualification. But, but... He's seriously standing by his position? Is he even allowed to do that? He'll make a real find a way to be able to do that. Remember, Herr Jones, consequences are irrelevant. It's only our intention that matters. To become too invested in an individual scenario is to undermine the sanctity of thought. Once a maxim fulfills the universe <laughs> again? Universe, universal, 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 I'm sorry, chat. Universality test, it can be accepted as a categorical imperative. At that point, we are ob obligated to obey it, always. Obey. The universe, I'm going to stumble on that all time, all night. The universality test?
Yeah, the method through which we would discover and verify categorical imperatives. Allow me to elaborate. Do I have to? Oh, we are fighting for his life. Never mind. In order to verify the morality of an idea, one must subject it to the universality test. Imagine a world in which everyone follows the maxim behind your action. If a contradiction or irrationality arises, the maxim cannot be moral. And there we go. Explain the universality test. Check. <laughs> it's so dumb. I love this. He's so listy. As convoluted as he is, I loved his little... I love that he has a to-do list. <laughs> okay, hold on a minute. Hold on a moment. Where the heck are these things you keep checking off? Or, not? <laughs> that was a slip. She wants to know what they are. I'm like, where is your list? I gotta see. <laughs> Let me see what you gotta do today. How long does, you know, how many things do you have? How intricate does it get? I have created an agenda. All the tasks which I need to accomplish are presented upon it in sufficient detail. Where is it in my brain? The events of this debate are on your agenda? How is that even possible? Careful planning. Wisdom, Socrates Jones, is organized life. <laughs> and an organized person would be asking me questions right about now. Ouch. You leave, you leave me and, and Socrates alone. Right. This is getting harder and harder to deal with. I can't present something I don't understand, but I'm not sure how much longer I can go on. Yeah, that's everybody who reads Kant. I've got to find something and quick. I like the intense music. Can you back this up? We have established our principles must be unquestionably moral, yes? Well, in order to ensure such is the case, we must create a situation where every potential question would have, would have to be asked. Thus, the universality test is required. I'll we'll ask for clarification anyway. We must verify that your maxim stands as valid in all situations. Imagine a world in which everyone follows the maxim behind your action. How is this related to everything? It is an essential step of the universality test. I'm going to ask for re relevance of it. How is that related to your conclusion? This illustrates the nature of the test. Imagine a world in which everyone follows the maxim behind your action. Can you back this up? <clears throat> well, it's an instruction. <laughs> if you don't understand it, I could explain it better. Please do. What do you mean by this? Essentially, in every situation where someone is faced with a choice they could follow your maxim or not, they would follow it. That is the world you will be imagining. A contradiction or irrationality raises the maxim cannot be moral. We'll go with all the options because we can this one. A contradiction is a situation uh, which your maxim defeats itself. This is one way an idea can fa fail the universality test. An irrationality is when your maxim would create a world that is far worse for wear. A far worse. World that is worse for wear. Oh. That is the other way the universality test can be failed. Interesting. Let's see. While we're here. What do you have to support this? If there's a... If there's a contradiction, your idea creates problems with itself, therefore it cannot be moral. If it is rational, then you clearly shouldn't want it in the first place. These are pretty good reasons for these to be grounds to fail the test, are they not? What's the next one? Oh, I see. 
I'll just keep going. <clears throat> if it details how Maxim could fail the universality test, it would be not be much of a test if you could not fail. I don't know. I wouldn't mind taking a test like that. <laughs> Contradictions are Maxim which are inconsistent with themselves. Let us imagine, oh, that's right, accepted that one should lie for their own gain, as the advantages of lying come entirely from deceiving those who tell the truth. In a world where everyone lies, there's no advantages at all. In this way, lying for one's gain contains a contradiction. It simply does not make sense when applied to universal law. Man, this guy really hates lying. This is just one example. Anytime an idea creates inconsistencies with itself, it cannot work. All right, so let's check the idea t slab. Never lie, intention, and help the dying man. <laughs> Excuse me? If an idea, after being applied to everyone, creates situations where people may be willed to behave in opposing ways, then your idea is a contradictory. As a result, it probably should not be considered. How is this related to your conclusion? This elaborates upon the nature of the contradiction failure. Rationalities create a world in which which is worse for wear. How is that related to your conclusion? This elaborates upon the nature of irrationality failure. Can you back this up? I think this stands pretty solidly. One cannot will a world which would be worse than this one. Hmm. Well, sometimes the world would clearly be worse off if everyone followed a maxim. For example, if everyone stole from another, our sense of security would deteriorate. It would be irrational to will such a world to be. Thus, stealing is categorically immoral. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Contradictions are max. So our ideas are never lie and help the dying man and intentionalism. That is a doozy. Everyone follows the maximum behind your action. If the hunt fiction maximum cannot be memorial. What about, you can intend things though, they're contradictory though, right? Oh, no. Uh, contradictions are maxims which are inconsistent with themselves. Rationalists create a world which is worse for wear. Hmm. What do you think, chat? <laughs> uh, let's see. But they must be intention based. Like, you can't submit them to rules and then say that, and then, not, because then, like, you have the intention, right? Emmanuel Kant. 
What's the one thing which, from the very beginning of our discussion, you emphasized above all else? Intentionalism, of course. What we will is far more important than what we make. Right, that's what I thought. And that's fascinating, because checking for irrationality sounds a lot like assessing the consequences to me. What? <laughs> you claim we cannot will a p world that is worse than the one that we have now. But the fact is, the very act of assessing how the world would be gives weight to consequences. Ooh, we got him now. You'd think that you would throw this out, but instead you have this as a key step in the universality test. Determining which your maxim is a, whether your maxim is a categorical imperative is thus a fundamentally consequentialist procedure. Ooh. I, I, <laughs> ah. This is not on my agenda. It is most impractical. <laughs> I demand you stop at once. But surely you see my point. It is quite ironic, don't you think? That the process which creates the rules for our intentionless ideals relies so heavily on assessing consequences. You talk about internal contradictions being grounds for failure. Well, here's a grand one for you. The universality test would fail itself. <laughs> Incredible. It seems to me that either consequences matter or your method of choosing ideas of is incorrect. So which is it, Kant? Which part is wrong? Either way, it seems pretty devastating to your ideas. <laughs> we got them now. This, your thoughts, so disorganized. <laughs> Order, I need direction. I need... I need nine. <laughs> Have my philosophical constructs thrown into question? Check. <laughs> I need some water. Oh, give me a moment, Chad. Uh, does not compute. <laughs> 2023. You have done an excellent job here. I would be lying if I said you had not given me much to think about. Perhaps another decade of silence is in order. Silence and thought. Auf Wiedersehen, Herr Jones. I hope I said that correct. Is it over? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think so. I guess that's all, that's all we're going to get out of Kant. And now the final battle. Complete the fifth debate of Socrates Jones. Achievement check. <laughs> I'm going to save it real quick. Well, that was quite a spirited performance, Socrates. Who would have thought that an accountant from New York would turn out to be such a great debater? See, he loves his job. What a great, you know, what enthusiasm. Thank you, Arbiter. I believe Frederick Nietzsche has volunteered to discuss his ideas with you next. A prominent, if sometimes paradoxical, thinker, he's often quoted by the angsty things of your era. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> okay. Give me a moment and I will retrieve him. Of course. Sigh. You okay, Ari? I don't know how you're still doing this, Dad. I mean, look at me. I'm getting tired and I'm just helping out. I know, Ari. I was personally hoping Kant's answer would hold up. At this point, I kind of think the nature of morality is impossible to find. Ooh. Ooh, you 
You've done it now. You pulled back the curtain, friend. What did you just say? Oh, uh, I said I kind of think the nature of morality is impossible to find. Huh. Interesting. Oh, no! Unfortunately, while interesting, that description of the nature of morality is also incorrect. Wait, what? I'm very sorry, but the rule states he only has one chance, and I'm afraid that was it. What the hell? That was completely bogus! My dad wasn't trying to provide an answer just then, he was just thinking to himself. Tell him, Dad! Tell him you didn't intend to make a statement about morality! Uh-oh. Don't do it! Don't do it! Dad? Ari? He's right. What? What I, just, what I said was, in fact, a statement about the nature of morality. I can't deny that. I'm glad you're taking this reasonably, Socrates. Again, the deepest of apologies. I hope you will be able to make yourself comfortable here. Wait. Arbiter, before you leave, can I ask you one thing? I suppose. Why? Excuse me. Why am I wrong? Come now, your stance is full of fools, Socrates. Of that much there is no doubt. So you've said, but why? If I'm going to be here forever, I'd like to at least understand why I'm wrong. Very well, Socrates. That is only fair. Allow me to spell it out for you. Ooh. Ooh. You're taking down the Arbiter as we speak. You've presented your philosophical views. Your premise is foolish as morality has a tangible impact. The world is clearly bettered when individuals strive to be better. I see little reason to doubt the existence of some form of morality in our world. Shit, son, we found the boss fight. I know, right? And there we go, Socrates. As you can see, your answer is flawed to the core. I see. Well, if you don't mind, Arbiter, I'd like to ask you a few questions. It begins! It begins! Here we go! What? Dad, do you really intend to challenge the Arbiter? Yes, I do. Well, listen, I don't know if you forgot this, but uh, he's the Arbiter. <laughs> you see little reason, so you see some reason? <laughs> so... Ari, you once told me to never let an argument go unexamined, didn't you? Frankly, we both know I'm clueless about philosophy. For all my bombast, it's only because of your advice that we've lasted as long as we have. But Dad... We've encountered many arguments that looked solid on the surface, but each and every one of them had a flaw. If we don't look closely at this one, how can we know it's not the same? Examine everything. There's too much on the line for us to forget that now, no matter how scary our opponent looks. Alright, Dad. Wish- oh, I missed that part. Dang. Well, this is... unexpected, Socrates. I confess, you have piqued my interest. I suppose, given all you have done, some questions are warranted. Ask away, but do not feel too hurt when you come up short. Oh, I see. How's this related to your conclusion? Establish just the simple fact I am responding to you, Socrates. What views were those? Come now, Socrates. Do you really need me to outline your own opinions? I just can't help but feel everything would be clearer if you did. Very well, then, if you insist. You claim that morality does not exist. Can you back this up? Socrates, be reasonable. Did you not say these words to yourself? Oh, yes. All right, Arbiter. I admit, you have realized a strong... You have raised a strong objection to the idea that morality does not exist. Thank you, Socrates. As governor of this realm, it would be tragic if I had not. Do you now see why such an answer is insufficient? 
Of course, there's just one problem. That wasn't my answer. What? What you were arguing against is two steps removed from what I actually said. You've discredited the non-existence of morality, but I claimed that the answer to morality might not be findable. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> well then, those are essentially the same thing. No, they're not. I think we can all agree morality exists in some form for the reasons you have described. Even if it were different for each person, as Protagoras argued, there's little doubt we could develop some guidelines that we, sorry, there's little doubt we could develop some guidelines for how we should behave. But that doesn't mean we should, what we seek, a perfect definition for morality, exists as well. Morality could very well be more abstract, like faith or happiness. Just because it exists doesn't mean that there is an objectively best model. Therefore, I can claim a perfect answer does not exist without throwing morality itself out the window. An answer demands morality, but morality does not demand an answer. I can't believe it! We may just survive after all! <laughs> so as you can see, Arbiter, the argument you've built is a very effective counter, but it has to counter something I did- but it's a counter to something I did not claim. Oh. Oh, he's got it now. I apologize for misunderstanding your initial point, Socrates. I guess it's always important to make sure the person you're debating understands you clearly, huh? Amen to that. So Dad's position makes sense now, right? Does that mean you can accept his answer? I'm afraid not. His position still has a number of critical flaws. Allow me to explain. Socrates, you claim a flawless answer cannot be found. Let me save it. And another drink of water, because all this narrating is making my throat dry. One moment. I do not see how this can become can be possible when there are infinite potential answers. Already here you have seen arguments of many branches and formulations. With possibilities so incomprehensibly vast, surely one must stand as infallible. With this being the case, it is only a matter of time before we find the answer. As you can see, Socrates, as long as the possibilities are infinite, the answer is findable. Mm. Interesting argument, based around a mathematical concept, I see. Well, you forgot one thing, Arbiter. I'm an accountant! I deal with faulty numbers all the time! <laughs> wow, Dad, I just got shivers. So you already know what the problem here is? No. Well, no. But I couldn't pass up my one chance to be make being an accountant sound cool. I mean, no hate there. You you take your moment and you run with it. <laughs> Remember when I said I trusted you just five minutes ago? Don't make me rethink that. Hey! Being stuck here forever would be bad enough without having to make total fools of ourselves. Socrates, do you actually intend... Do you intend to actually ask me questions? I understand if you do not. You have placed yourself in an unfortunate position. It may be easier to just admit to your error. As if! <laughs> okay, Arbiter, let's rumble. <clears throat> okay. What's our idea slate so far? Oh! Oh, we don't have an idea slate. Ooh. Do you not see how this can be possible when there are infinite potential answers? Already here, you have seen arguments of many branches and formulations. With possibly so incomprehensibly vast, surely one must stand as infallible. Back 
this up for me. What do you mean? Well, what makes you so sure that one of them is perfect? Socrates, is the answer not in the infinite itself? Arbiter? Yes, Socrates. The argument you are making here is quite simple on the surface. I can see why, with so many possible answers, you might believe one of them has to be true. Might believe? <laughs> it's not what's said, it's not what isn't being said. Correct, for while I understand where you're coming from, I'm afraid infinity doesn't work quite the way you think it does. Huh? Uh, I don't understand either, Dad. What do you mean? Okay, time for a math lesson. <laughs> To put it plainly, infinite is not the same as all-encompassing. They may sound similar, but the two are actually entirely different. There are infinite real numbers between 0 and 1, but none of them are 2. Likewise, there are many infinite potential ways to try to define morality, but that does not guarantee that one of them is perfect. Well, come now, Socrates. Even if I cannot prove the answer is out there, probability is surely on my side. Philosophical thought is so diverse that the amount of ground which is covered is truly incredible. With this being the case, surely it seems more likely than not the answer exists, yes? Does it? Over the course of my time here, every philosopher I have encountered has claimed to have the answer to your question. However, close examination revealed that, diverse as they were, all of them had flaws. Come to think of it, that's true. Nope, that is a baseless assumption. <laughs> Faced with a parade of great thinkers, all failing to accomplish the same task you have assigned me, my position only seems stronger. <laughs> Sounds like the Arbiter doesn't understand math, or Arbiter or Socrates doesn't understand math. There is no evidence that the set of possible answers contains perfection. In fact, it seems extremely unlikely. unlikely. The fact is, the existence... It doesn't sound like the Arbiter understands math. I know, right? The fact is, the existence of infinite possibilities does not guarantee a certain possibility is among them. Any claim that it does not is simply and objectively false. Now, I guess you can understand the mistake. You are the ruler of the realm of ideas and not the realm of facts, after all. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Don't go that low. But as an accountant, I could never stand for such an assumption. Well, that's true. Math doesn't play around with soft uh, thinking. <laughs> making that liberal arts or lawyer argument the pretty word approach without any data. Hmm? Nonsense. You heard that? He said nonsense. <laughs> Socrates, let us set aside the witticisms and return to the basics for a moment. You have posited here that there may, in fact, be no provable answer to the question of morality? Yes. You claim, in fact, that there is no evidence to support there being such an answer? Why are you asking so many questions? My dad just said all these things to reassert that he believes the way he does before he turns it around. Don't you see? Haven't you ever watched Law and Order? <laughs> Relax, Ari. Yes, Arbiter. An existence of infinite answers cannot itself be considered proof. I see. Well, Socrates, these are all interesting points, but I believe there's one important detail you have forgotten. The answer has been found before. Ooh. You claim there's no answer to be found, but history stands against you. Cause, oh, that's right, because they said the realm. Anyway, I thought that they said that the that it was um, Socrates himself that found the answer. The great, th yep, the great thinker Socrates completed the task and was granted his wish. His answer had to be proved for this to occur. Clearly there is an answer and it's possible to find. So you see, Socrates, the answer to morality is clearly findable. But he doesn't know well, that's why Socrates left. He assumes this. Oh. If it were not, the great thinker would not have been able to find it. Dad, 
He he may have me actually. No, he doesn't. Don't say that yet. I'd forgotten about the first Socrates exploits. If he found the answer, I can't really argue with that. No, yes, you can. Don't give up. You you and your daughter's life is like it's hinging on this. You've got to figure it out. Now you understand why I cannot accept your answer. No, not exactly. You agree that continuing this debate would be foolish, yes? I... Is that it? Do I have to concede? No! Even though we came so far, Ari, I'm sorry. Arbiter... <laughs> Surprise! Surprise, mother effer. Worry not, old friend. There is still hope yet. <laughs> Protagoras? Not just Protagoras. It's the whole team. We got the whole gang. Not just Protagoras. What are you all doing here? <laughs> we have come to back you up, old chap. But why? I love the fife in the background. <laughs> it's an uprising. Uprising! Can you hear the philosopher sing? <laughs> but why? But why ingratitude is the essence of vileness? <laughs> I gained much from our discussion. Now it is time to return the favor. You are in trouble and it is the imperative and the imperative dictates that I assist. Helping a dying man added to the ideal slate. Exactly. There's no happiness to be gained from watching a friend struggle. I can be most useful here, assisting you from the sidelines. Good is happiness added to the ideal slate. We formed a contract to find the answer, and I must follow it to the end. <laughs> we'll work together. Add to the ideal slate. Euthyphro? <laughs> Even you? Uh, and you, Euthyphro, is he here for moral support? <laughs> He's so mad. <laughs> Humph. My child, you are still a blasphemer. Rest assured, the gods will smite you one day. But until then, I suppose I could lend you a hand. <laughs> it's not like he likes you or anything. Baka. Being men, we are all incredibly flawed. Our only help is lies in helping each other. Mankind is flawed. Added to the idea slate. Oh, this is so sweet. I know, right? Let's get some fan art of the philosophers hanging out with Socrates. Chilling out like true bros. <laughs> Thank you, all of you. All right, Arbiter. I'm not going to give up just yet. Humph. This is deteriorating into madness, Socrates. Now that's just... That's philosophy, my friend. But very well. I shall entertain you a little longer. I'm going to save real quick. And take another sip of water. I feel like I'm getting all of my water intake while I'm reading these off. Okay. Sorry, I had to move the thing. You claim there's no answer to be found, but history stands against you. Oh, that's right. Our ideas 
Uh, we have mankind is flawed, people work together, good is happiness, intentionalism, and your face is ugly. The history stands against you. The great thinker Socrates completed the task and it was and was granted his wish. Where's your proof? Socrates' absence from this plane is quite conspicuous. Indeed, we have all missed the great thinker. You saw the story you created just by sharing his name. I don't need much evidence to show he is granted an exit. Yeah, you do. This answer had to be approved for this to occur. Approved how? It is quite simple. If this answer had not been determined to be correct, none of this could have happened. Can you back that up? The story has been told countless times, Socrates. Indeed, it is legend in this realm. Scripture, even. Okay, alright, I get it, jeez. Clearly, this is an answer and it is possible to find. I'm just chest t chesting. <laughs> testing it out. As Socrates found the answer, the answer must be findable. Proof doesn't get much more simple than that. Yes, it does. I mean, there's clearly an answer and it's possible to find. I'm not sure how I could be more clear than that. Even I thought that was well-organized thought. You don't count. Go home, Kant. Thinker has also granted his wish. What do you mean by this? Many centuries ago, Socrates came to the current arbiter claiming he found the answer to morality. This was the last anyone saw of him. When there's no answer to be found, the history stands against you. Can you back that up? He doesn't know that it was specifically that answer that he found. True. Patience, Socrates. Am I about to elaborate? How is that related to your conclusion? It details the flaw with your claim and I shall counter it. Okay, so let's check the idea slate. According to Kant, all true moral systems must be intention based. We all believe that something can be called good as long as it increases overall happiness. People often help each other in order to further their overall good. And that sentence being flawed and make often bad judgments. Let's save it again. The great thinker Socrates complimented clearly the test and was granted his wish. The censor had to be approved for this to occur. Truly, there is an answer and it is possible to find. I challenge that because I don't know what externally told me found that answer. All I knew could have found the answer according to Seven Heavens or something, but uh. Yeah, I was thinking of doing it with the uh, the working together. That's wrong with your argument. I'm sorry, Socrates, but I fail to see what that has to do with anything I've said. You seem to be grasping at straws. Are you sure you would not rather end this flu end this foolishness? have to use one on each like several different things there is excellence but what about mankind is flawed we'll try that oh I don't think I'm doing well uh, try relevance actually I'm gonna I'm gonna. Where did we go to? Yeah, argument three. Okay. Alright. That's right, we talked to everybody. And then we had our little team building thing. And everybody wanted to be our friend. So wait, do I have to counter every single argument? I th see. So there's four 
arguments, and there's four idea slate things. So I think you have to use a... Uh, maybe. The great thinker Socrates completed the cast and was granted his wish. And I, I think I'm gonna get everything clarified. And back. And the relevance. Details of fall of your claim, and I shall now counter it. What you mean by this? May some sure goes. This is the fast, okay. I think I'm just gonna get with it. I want to get to at least where everything is checked out, and then I'm gonna save it so I can. Since you're not determined to be correct, none of this has happened. So yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all the stuff I got last time. And then I'm going to start to ask uh, relevance. And then, um, then I'll start challenging. I already read this and I don't want to read them again. Okay. Socrates, the approval is, in fact, the evidence supporting the great thinker actually have found the answer. After all, it's difficult to believe these things are true, no? Without the judgment of the previous arbiter verifying that his answer was indeed correct, I suppose many would have trouble believing it. Oh. You should take note of this, my friend. His answer had to be approved for this to occur. Oh. His approval makes the validity's answer undoubtable. Does it, though? Does it? Oh, that's the issue. What do you mean by this? Which is what well, let us know that what Socrates was correct. And try this straightforward. I think I'm gonna give me one second. I'm gonna um, get another drink of water real quick. Does it make it that undoubtable, though? Socrates, the original arbiter, was widely respected in this world. Do you really intend to question his judgment? Yes. It's the course on which the Temple of Reason is built. Now he's son of Euthyphro. Or maybe Kant. Some sick fusion of the two. Alright, so... I'm going to save progress, and the reason, but then human, but beings are flawed. That's the issue. Nonsense. Arbiter, <clears throat> what now, Socrates? You claim that we can be sure that Socrates found the answer? Correct. And we know this is for sure because your predecessor verified its validity. Indeed. That's what I thought. Well then, to demonstrate what's wrong with your argument, I'm going to cite one of my colleagues here. Euthyphro! Yes, my child? <laughs> Do you remember your statements on the wisdom of man? Of course. Human beings are fallible and vain. They make mistakes. Gods, however, are... Yes, yes, that's quite enough. Preaching, thank you. <laughs> Aw, he was so sad! Should have could have at least like let him finish. Okay, he was insufferable, but he was so excited. <laughs> you the fro, god dang, this man get thrown around. Yeah, I know. He just wanted to you just want to say his peace, but okay. Alright. Now, Arbiter, let me make this clear for you. 
Euthyphro Euthyphro may have been wrong about where morality comes from, but he was right about this. Human beings are far from perfect. We can never forget this. And as flawed beings, the answer we formulate will be similarly flawed. As a result, I find it hard to believe that Socrates really did find the answer. What? <laughs> That's the first time I've seen him look mad. I liked him when he was happier. The fact is, as imperfect beings, we must always remember we are flawed. The moment we go far enough to claim our answer is perfect, we close our minds. Yeah, it is true. I know from experience. I too have fallen into this trap. Indeed, even the best of us can succumb. For this reason, we must never assume we have the answer. But Socrates, the first arbiter, are both human. Or human-like entities, at the very least. Regardless, how do we know that their judgment, their answer, was not an error? You have admitted to your fair share of mistakes today. There's no reason the previous arbiter couldn't have made some as well. You can't base the credibility of your entire argument upon the appeal to authority. Ooh, we getting into the logical fallacies. We got him now. Very well put, Socrates. Indeed, even I am convinced you could have been wrong all those years ago. Er, right. <laughs> Arbiter, if a false conclusion was presented convincingly enough, even your pre predecessor could have made a mistake thus leading to the discovery of an answer that was actually impossible to find. It's still possible a perfect answer is outside of our reach. So as you can see, you haven't proven anything. Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> Very well, Socrates. You have a point. I confess that even with the backing of the original Arbiter, I cannot prove that an answer exists. Yes, I knew it, I knew. However... Before you go and celebrate, I wish to point out you cannot reasonably prove it does not. Ooh. With us at such an impasse, it boils down to a matter of potential consequences. Let us assume for just a moment that what you have postulated here is true. Let us say for a moment that morality cannot be found. Most philosophy is pretty words and wordcraft. Well, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> Most shape the arguments win. Uh, yeah. Pretty much. I cannot believe you truly understand the consequences of your suggestion. Let me show you why you, what you claim cannot possibly, oh, I got that wrong. Let me show you why what you claim cannot possibly be right. Socrates, you have just argued we can never be sure of our answers. If that is the case, then there's no point to what we do here. We might as well all give up and become accountants. I mean, if you wanna. There's no way we can accept a theory with such horrible consequences. And that is my position on the matter. How could you say such a thing, Arbiter? You have just devalued everything we do here. There is no happiness to be gained from that. I am merely showing the worrisome implications of Socrates Jones's argument. If you take issue with them, you should take it up with him. Rude! I knew- <laughs> Poor Euthyphro. I knew it! I knew you were up to no good, my child! Trying to lure us all to your level. Make us into accountants. The secret accountant agenda. <laughs> Oh, shut up, Euthyphro. The Arbiter's clearly straw manning Dad, distorting his argument in order to make it sound weaker. Yeah. Dad doesn't actually want everyone to become accountants, right? Of course not. Oh, good. Thank the gods. <laughs> I, mean, I, I want to be judgy, but I really have to admit that if someone said that I had to become an accountant, my first thought would be... Please no. <laughs> I don't want to make a career off the maths. Arbiter, you must be getting desperate to revert to sort resort to such tricks. Even if what you said here were true, the fact that a conclusion is uncomfortable does not mean it should be ignored. Nonsense. 
It does, however, mean we should be wary of accepting it. I must confess, old chap, I would find it hard to believe that anything that created such an... Or I would find it hard to believe anything that created such an outcome. As would I. It would be foolish to jump to water so brimming with sharks. Well then, I suppose I will just have to show that there are few... That there are no sharks, won't I? That the consequences of my argument are not so easily... Or are not nearly so disastrous. Very well, Socrates. But first, let me issue an ultimatum. Ooh, boss bill indeed. This is your last chance. My last what? You gave an answer. The game is already over. It is only through my mercy that it continues. And your damaging claims are beginning to wear my mercy thin. If you cannot show why this conclusion isn't disastrous, I will refuse to accept it as you once refused Hobbes. I find it impossible to believe that the answer would be one that made the search itself meaningless. So again, this is your last chance. All right, Arbiter. One last chance is all I need. I'll show you once and for all why my viewpoint can stand. Here we go, friends. Let's see. We have four of them. Can you back up that there's no point to what we do here? Yes, please do. The logic that supports this idea is fairly intuitive, but I shall spell, spell it out. If your conclusion stands, then our efforts to define morality have always been reaching for an impossible goal. Re reaching for something that is forever out of our grasp. Mm. If that goal is impossible, all of our efforts toward it is clearly a waste. If your roads don't lead anywhere, what's the point of building them? It's like you've never done philosophy before. That's the whole point of it. The whole point is the journey. That's what philosophy is. The journey. <laughs> the philosophy journey. That's... You're doing an, a, a philosophy. That's what you do. <laughs> he's just... He's just trying to give us a counterpoint. Fair enough. With these two points laid bare, there can be little doubt our efforts are useless. With that said, though, I don't think we should forget these points. I'd like to look at them a little more closely. We are striving in vain towards something which cannot be accomplished. Can you back that up? It is supported by your stated outlook. You claim it is impossible to obtain the solution, or be certain of it at the very least. If this is the case, all efforts to do so are misguided. Are they, though? And if we cannot achieve our goal, then there's no reason to try. Mm, I don't know about that one, Chief. Okay, so we d already did the... Mankind is flawed. People work together. Good is happiness and intentionalism. And we cannot achieve our goal. There's no reason to try. Uh, maybe it's intentionalism. Let's try intentionalism. this way. There's the point to what we're doing here. Can you back this up, this ridiculous and insulting statement? I've established it does not make sense for us to pursue something other than perfection. Therefore, if we cannot achieve our goal, we might as well go and assume a... Oh, <laughs> assume a... <clears throat> lower profession. Of which accounting is one example. Grr. 
Not even the Arbiter can resist making a dig at my profession. Is it really such an easy target? Yeah, kinda. There's no way we can accept the theory with such horrible consequences. Hmm. Can you back this up? There's a little difference between difficult and impossible, Socrates. Difficult is worth the effort. A difficult goal may take years or even millennia to accomplish. But in the end, the rewards can be extraordinary. Once a goal is proven impossible, however, you are only creating pointless pain for yourself with your struggles. It is better to refocus your efforts than to continue to reach for these impossible things. That was actually fairly reasonably laid out. Yes, well, wonderful to know the Arbiter still is brilliant when he's tearing me to pieces! Let's see. Find something to challenge, even if the morality itself is or isn't some lofty transcendental wisdom. Oh, I didn't see what. I don't know what you're saying, chat. Something missed. I don't know. Must have skipped. Either that or I did, didn't get it. Hmm. Can you back that up? What did he just ask? Mr. Jones just asked his opponent to back up his own conclusions. Again? <laughs> oh, such so judgy. Philosopher major is lower than a cow. Hmm. I don't think so. I think that both, uh, both of them are important, and because it's not, you don't go to college just to learn job skills. You learn to get an education, and that's different. But anyway, afraid so. <laughs> Hey guys, remember that one time when I presented my own statement for back backing and it was right the right thing to do? Cut me some slack. <laughs> you just argue we never be sure of our answers. If that is the case, then there's no point to what we do here. What do you mean by this? I mean that we as philosophers serve no purpose if a ridiculous conclusion is allowed to stand. I believe that thought is pretty clear clear enough for me to wonder if you're wasting my time. I think it's important to check because... It? Oh, maybe... Well, if it makes us happy, then we can call it good and purposeful. So let's try that next. something which cannot be accomplished. But we intend to do it though. Alright. We'll try it again. Oh, I'm failing hard. If we can achieve cannot shoot that's no uh I'm gonna fail, aren't I? <laughs> Game over, man! Alright, let's try... Wait, just give me one more chance, then. No, Socrates, I've given you more than enough chances. Those chances have not worn themselves through. I hope you will be able to make yourself comfortable, Socrates. This is your final stop. Goodbye, Socrates Jones. I was so close. Maybe if I'd had a more focused approach... Is this really the end? Not because when we can save things. Aw, we have to... Oh wait, am I... Wait, which chapter are we in? Like, I thought we got to argument four. Oh wait. I think we're... Okay, let's just continue. Yeah, because... Uh, 
Like, I think I got that one. So, yeah, I don't really know. What do you mean by this? I think I got these all done. So I'm gonna just keep... Possible goal. Oh, hmm, okay. So I let's we're gonna get these two more. What do you mean by this? It's phosphorus. Oh yeah, we already saw that. by your state outlook. Okay. Can you elaborate? Socrates is the duty of every moral f Oh! Possible to create a perfect definition of morality. This is what we all work so hard for, and we can't find our perfect answer. Our efforts are in vain. I believe all this has been made clear before, but not as clear as it was made now. Flummery. You can get it without being perfect. It's, it strikes me as fairly obvious. A perfect answer is the only answer worth pursuing. Says who? Ha! Perfection is indeed desirable, but yeah, it is elusive. Hmm. How is this related to your conclusion? It spells out the goal of philosophers clearly in order to show your conclusion directly harms it. Look at the last ones. Is that even relevant? How is this nonsense related to your conclusion? It defines what role we would all have. Oh, that's right. We already did that. Stop it, all of you. Our word of this adds nothing substantial to your argument, and you know it. He found the red herring! Very well, Socrates. I suppose I may have gotten carried away. Oh. What do you mean by this? I cannot accept your argument given the consequences. Arbiter is getting mad. But technically, you could accept it, right? Yes, I suppose I could. <laughs> Technically, then accept it. No! Just because I could doesn't mean I should. We are looking for the nature of morality, and your answer in is immoral in itself. How is this related to your conclusion? Okay. So I think it's the last one. We're striving vain towards something which cannot be accomplished. Which one is it? If that's the case, then there's no point to what we do here. We're striving toward that something that cannot be accomplished. Our efforts are worth nothing unless we're able. But man is imperfect! That is. Okay! Tend to find it uh, or not. Uh, 
There we go. I admit, I guessed on that one. I think I finally figured out what's wrong with your entire position. Have you now? Actually, which one? Yeah. Actually, let's... I think I, I don't want to lose the next one, so we'll just... Sneak back from our... Aww! Okay. That was stupid. I was stupid, I was stupid, I, that was dumb, and I shouldn't have done that. Uh... Okay. It was, what, good is happiness? There we go. Arbiter, I think I finally figured out what's wrong with your entire position. Have you now? I think we have. Let me take another sip because I feel, I feel like I'm in the point where I'm just like wheeling through the game and I'm not commenting as much. So give me a moment while I take another sip of water. Okay. <clears throat> Have you now? Remember, you will not get another chance. I know, and I don't need one. This arbiter is the end. Farewell, Socrates. Tell me then, what is wrong with my position? It's quite simple, really. A classic fallacy. You are assuming a solution must be for perfect to have value, but that is not the case, right? In fact, such a, this, an, an inception strikes me as fundamentally wrong. Look at that credibility. Everybody else agrees. Really agrees. <laughs> Their faces. I like how um, P P Protagoras is sitting there. Everyone else is shocked and he's like into it. He's like, yes. Yes, tell him why he's wrong. Oh, I was too soon. Oh, let down. Oh, well. Do it. Do it. I just realized that over half of us have facial hair. <laughs> you hear that, kids? Uh, only the coolest and the most famous philosophers must have some facial hair. I'm not sure how to cope with my distress. You should add that to your agenda. Anyway, perfection is, as a general rule, an attractive prospect in every field, but things do not have to be perfect to add value to the world. Let us look at art. Even works as great as the statue of David or the Mona Lisa are not without their flaws. But despite their flaws, can there be any doubt the world is a brighter place because such works exist? Oh, then it says Mill would say they're so good because they increase happiness. Exactly. Whether or not Mill's ideas dominate, increasing overall happiness is certainly one way an imperfect work can contribute. But under your logic, none of these works would have meaning. That's the real dis disastrous conclusion here. <clears throat> There's no happiness to be gained from that. Humph. Look at all the people around you, Arbiter. All these philosophers came forward with their own versions of morality. Ultimately, their views all turned out to be flawed, but does that make their ideas worthless? Of course not. Their theories have a profound positive impact on the world. Anyone in my high school philosophy class could tell you as much. Flaws and all, their attempted moral systems stand stronger than those created without thought, and the importance of this is palpable. Just because perfectionism might be unattainable, does not mean we should not try it. It only means we cannot expect to succeed. This is quite impressive, old friend. Indeed, you may have truly done it, Herr Jones. I don't know. 
true is it our duty to keep questioning always and forever? For while we can never assume our ideas are perfect, if we don't keep searching, we will miss the chance to find something better. The fact we can never be sure the fact we can never be sure does not mean we should not hypothesize. The goal may be unattainable, but all the progress made towards it is still the fundamental good. In a way, searching for morality is, in fact, the most moral thing you can do. What do you have to say to that, Arbiter? I say... I say... <laughs> Look how, how happy he is. It's all good. <laughs> Uh-oh. He's got the maniacal hands out. I'm not gonna... <laughs> My throat is already... I haven't read this much in a while out loud. I'm afraid if I start my maniacal laughing, then he'll... I'll never recover. At least till the next stream. Arbiter. Oh, wonderful! You broke the sovereign! <laughs> nice going, hero! <laughs> uh, now we'll have to get a new one! No, no. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's just funny. Funny? Yes, funny. I realize now I've become arrogant in my time ruling this plane. I simply assumed a perfect answer was out there, waiting to be found, despite the fact the one I had found myself so many years ago was wrong. And to think it would be you who would put the pieces together. It's humorous, really. What are you talking about? He is not wise because of what he knows, but because he knows what he does not know. People used to say this about me all the time. Now I believe it better applies to you. Wait. Hold on. You! Guess who? Yes, that's right, Protagoras. Guess who? I am, or was, the great thinker Socrates. What? <laughs> Called it. You did not. What? Yeah, I figured it out like an hour ago. An unverifiable claim, but there's no denying that this de denying this one is sharp enough. Lag. Can you see chat? Did you get, did you get the did you get the surprise? Did you, do you know the secret now? No? Yes? It's lagging. Oh, that sucks. <sighs> okay. I'm going to give chat a little more time because I don't want to I don't want to surprise your view is anybody else in chat out there am I going to spoil it for everybody one chatter knows the secret oh good so at least that means that not all of as long as the entire chat isn't left there going like I have no idea what's going on so I guess I can kind of skip and continue and, and fingers crossed, fingers crossed that we won't uh, a break before we get to the end. Uh, try refreshing. I say this because I have so few chatters, and I appreciate people who go on to chat and actually chat. It means a lot to me. So yes, chat, I will slow down and make sure that you're along with me. Oh good, oh good. Just keep me, keep me updated, chat, because you're here with me. I'm here with you. We're in this together. So I'm not going to continue without you unless everybody 
<laughs> the school bus doesn't leave without everybody on it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let's see. So there's a secret that we found out. And it's that this guy was the original great thinker. Regardless, finding the answer was my greatest accomplishment. I convinced the old arbiter that I had found the solution. I even briefly convinced myself. And as a result, I won the challenge. The arbiter gave me his mantle and told me I was to take his place as the ruler of this realm. The special school mask and everything. I took it and became what you see now. But you said Socrates left. And you didn't immediately recognize me as not you? My friend, why would you go so far to hide your identity? I gave up who I was to oversee this realm. As Socrates, I may have been respected, but I also made my fair share of enemies. Yeah. Well, kind of. I mean, if I recall from my own courses, I thought that they told me he had to leave town quietly or die from poison. He's like, nope, I'm gonna stay here. You can't make me leave. But anyway. I felt that having found the answer, it was only appropriate to distance myself from all of that to better guide others toward the truth. Probably so that when people don't tell you stories about your last or the way you died, they wouldn't uh take a shot at your credibility. Of course, I once I real of course once I realized my solution was in fact incorrect, I became determined to goad someone else into finding it. <gasps> Bullying people shame. Never once thinking that perhaps it could be unreachable. In a way the old Socrates did leave that day, but now I think you've brought him back. Welcome back, Socrates. Well, good. well then, Socrates Jones, I think it's time I finally granted you your wish. You mean... Yes, it's time for you to head on home, the both of you. I... I can't believe it. We did it. We actually did it. But, wait, hold on. Does this mean you accept my answer is true? Am I a quote-unquote pro-philosopher? Certainly not. By your very own logic, you know I cannot do that. We won! We did! We did! And we found out that we're the new Socrates and the old Socrates has been here the whole time. Being happy and inside his skull mask. I do, however, accept your answer as the best I will receive right now, and I cannot ask for better than that. So... <laughs> he became a troll with the mane. I mean, he almost had crazy hair. Have you seen the statues of him? In fact, he has a less crazy beard than he does in the curly in a lot of the statues. No tricks? He can just walk through? Of course, Ar Ariadne. What do you take me for? Just making sure. So he's always a troll. <laughs> Yes, Socrates was always a troll, even back in ancient history. But I'm shh. Dad, do you know what I'm going to do first when I get home? What? <laughs> Sleep. Amen to that. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> well then, Hobbes, Mill, Protagoras, Kant, Euthyphro, Socrates, uh, Prime. What a name, Socrates Prime. I guess this is it. Goodbye, Herr Jones, you will be missed. Indeed, it was a pleasure making your acquaintance. I will miss you, Socrates. You are almost as intelligent as the original. <laughs> Sniffle. Thank you, all of you, for everything you've done. An extra big thank you to you, Mill. Seriously, you're just as awesome as I thought you'd be. I'm gonna miss you. <laughs> I am Socrates Prime. Plato is right. I have ascended to the ideal realm and I am now its sovereign. 
Now, now, Ar Ariadne Jones, you're going to make this old man blush. Let's not single anyone out, Ari. Everyone has been great. Except for except for maybe Euthyphro. Rude! What? Now wait a minute. Come on, Dad. Let's go. I've had enough of this weird floating architecture for good a good long time. All right, Ari, lead the way. Farewell, great thinker Jones. See you again in a few dozen years. Oh no, we're going back? Hmm. And that was it, Socrates Jones. Although there's one more thing I'm going to do once we get through the credits. Uh, it's been up for a while, but I... Home free, complete the first final debate. Yay! <laughs> Snoring while he's Euthyphro talking. Yes. So, uh... She's going back to class to talk about Hobbes. So yes, that was Socrates Jones. It's one of the... I haven't really found a philosophy based name <laughs> he's twirling his mustache in the mirror um it's really hard to find things that will ask you to critique argument like that um translation are wonderful fans it's been out for a while but i'm really excited that there's a new one coming out i'm excited that they have more political lean to it um <laughs> billy's deer repellent um, but they, I know that they, uh, in the screen cap, they showed, like, Machiavelli, among others. And so, I, I want to see what they have to say. And I'm excited for it to come out. Which is why I was, I decided to do it, because I just saw they went to, ooh, ooh, after credits, after credits, do we have an after credits? And then Veronica was all, actually, I think Kant is the best philosopher. Did you tell her he hates beards? <laughs> oh, of course, because I tell everyone about my trip to the afterlife. Hey, for a near-death experience, it was pretty cool. Your mother found it very interesting. You mean she fa found it ridiculous and was humoring her concussed ex? Yawn. Look, I'm pooped. Think I'll take a nap. You sure? There's a council debate on soon. You're a favorite. Ha ha, very funny. Have fun with that. It's nice to have things back to normal at last. Oh no. Oh no! Is that you, Ariadne Jones? Is this a prequel to the next one? What? What? Hmm, I must say this is a much earlier visit than I anticipated. But, but... Nonsense! Ari? To be continued. It is a preview! It is! Yay! That's new! <laughs> so, uh, so yes, this has been out for like 10 years, and I just recently got like at the very end of August that they were going to um, a convention and I I got an update notification from one of my um, tabs in Steam about it and that was when I found out that they have another one coming out the next one and this time it will be less Socrates and more Ariadne I assume I wasn't going to try to spoil that and left it ambiguous. But as you can see from the very ending here, that we have a part two coming out, and I am excited about it. So, yes. Oh, there's other. Ah, cool. Even philosophy games have post credit. <laughs> I got a special achievement for it. There's something I do want to check, actually. I gotta check something. Aww. 
So let's see. I wondered if I would get something special for using the, um... If I... Because I, not once did I use the, um... Uh... I didn't use the, uh... Your face argument. Or your face is ugly. But yes. So that was Socrates Jones. And the preview for the next one. Let me see if I can lower the volume here. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. So yes. Uh, well, I was gonna, I thought about doing more stuff, but it's, I didn't realize it would take me that long to get through it, but you know what? I'm okay with that. Um, I really enjoyed being able to work through the very last bits of it. I'm really happy I got to see the preview of the next part. And most importantly, I'm happy that we made it through the scuff in the early stream where I was reconnecting and disconnecting and reconnecting, where I tried to show my new model and there wasn't a voice. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm, what, I'm gonna try to continue to mess with my computer so I'm not constantly glitching in and out but um if you made it this far with me in the stream thank you for coming i hope to see you all next week at the same time and same place scuff is the mark of a true vtuber yes yes uh hopefully we will get better at resolving it and it will become more of a funny haha -ha choke joke instead of funny haha -ha choke <laughs> but yes uh, thank you again for joining me, and I hope to see you all next week. I look forward to seeing you, and I look forward to trying a new game out. Uh, I'll post it. I'll try to figure it out in the meantime, and then I'll let you guys know later what I'm thinking about. But in the meantime, again, thank you for joining me, and uh, I hope to see you again in the next stream. Take care. <laughs> Scuff is forever. Take care, and I will see you all in the next one next Thursday. Bye-bye.